Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to day two of the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference Competitive Advantage Talks presented by Ticketmaster. Uh, my name is Gerardo Guadiana. I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan, and it's my pleasure to be introducing our presentation today, Skating for Gold, Using Wearable Technology to Maximize Preparation for Elite Hockey Players, presented by Catapult Sports. Uh, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Adam Douglas, Applied Sports Sciences, Applied Sports Scientist at Catapult. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, everybody, and uh, uh, thank you very much for having me here to uh, to talk to you guys about our wearable technology and uh, more importantly about our application uh, in the sport of ice hockey. I'm really excited to be up here today because my talk today is going to cover basically three spheres of my professional and academic career. Uh, as we mentioned, I'm an applied sports scientist with Catapult Sports. I work with our ice hockey clients to maximize their information and their education about the data that they're collecting. I'm also a PhD student. I'm going to uh, have some of my work that I've been working on over the last few years with uh, Hockey Canada's uh, national women's team in my presentation, uh, but also I'm an applied practitioner. I work with Hockey Canada still, uh, so I'm very much boots on the ground with a lot of this. And, and really, my, my presentation today is about uh, conversations that have come up with coaches and coaching staffs that I've worked with in the past and how we've used that information uh, and some of the data we've collected to help those coaches better prepare our players. First and foremost, uh, as I said, with Hockey Canada, we have one goal at the onset of any tournament, and that's to win. We are essentially a gold medal or bust team. Uh, sometimes we bust, sometimes we win, hopefully more times than not we're gonna win. Now the thing to remember is the tournaments that we prepare our athletes for are short-term competition. It's five or six games in about 10 days, which is different than an 82 game season of preparation like the National Hockey League or some of our, our other leagues that we're all familiar with. We need to, be, to maximize our performance in a very short window of time of teams that don't always play together. So we try to do everything that we possibly can to get our players in the best positions to succeed. The two things I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to use two different examples for you. The first one is does practice adequately prepare our teams for performance? Now one of the things that you need to remember is the sport of ice hockey doesn't have a lot of applied literature in the research field. If a team came to me as a practitioner and said, okay, you know, what does a game look like in terms of what's happening on the ice? We can turn to time motion analysis. There's some heart rate information out there. But from a workload perspective, there's very few information out there, which actually led us with Hockey Canada becoming clients of Catapults three years ago because we didn't have a good enough way to measure the actual work that the players were doing on the ice. The second question here is then once we understand what the players are going to do, how can we use that to maximize their performance? As I said, I'm a strength coach by trade, so I, I know and understand how the body responds to volume and intensity changes through load. A lot of times throughout the course of a season, a lot of the load the players get exposed to is on ice. So let's try to maximize what they're doing on the ice as it fits into our technical tactical plan to better prepare those athletes. So those are the two questions we're gonna talk about today. Just so everybody uh, understands, uh, Catapult is wearable technology, okay? So it's an accelerometer, it's a gyroscope, and it's a magnetometer that is worn between the athlete's shoulder plates while they're on the ice. We can calculate force, direction, and body position while those athletes are doing ice hockey movements. It's essentially, uh, Catapult is well known as a GPS-based company for our outdoor sports. We just don't use the GPS inside. But what we can do is through some of the algorithms that Catapult has done and some of the filtering, really get a good understanding of the mechanical work that the athletes are, are being put under and are performing while they're playing their sport. Because at the end of the day, that's what matters to me, is that flag goes up, our athletes have a gold medal around their neck because it was based on the sport that they play. So let's get into what our performance questions stack up here. So number one, does practice adequately prepare our athletes for game performance? 
I'm going to use an example of our women's national team. They came away uh, with a silver uh, in Korea in tw at the 2018 Olympic Games about a, a, just a, a little over a year ago. Uh, shootout loss. Um, but I worked with that staff, that coaching staff, to try to understand how we can best prepare our athletes for those Olympic Games. Our women's team centralizes, meaning that all of the staff, uh, all of the full-time staff, all of the players move to one city in Canada and they, they train, they play games together in the uh, six-month lead-up to the Olympic Games. I am, I'm consult, consult with them, so I'm not a full-time member of staff, but our coaches came to us and said, halfway through, they weren't happy with the way our defense and were playing the game. Why can they not sustain intensity across all three periods of play? Why are they getting worse as the game progresses? Now, a lot of people might think that's a fitness issue. Well, I can stand here and tell you that our athletes on the Olympic team are fit. Okay, it's not necessarily a, a fitness from an aerobic, anaerobic standpoint. They're fit athletes. But is there something from that data that we can then turn to these coaches and help them with? Help them better understand what's happening. So, we turned to the research field, saw that there was nothing out there. No comparable, so we said we had to look at our data. So the first question we did is, what do games and practices look like? Almost every other sport you can go to that has a lot of information on wearable technology, you could easily find comparables. We needed to look internally at what our athletes were doing. So what you see here is player load per minute. Player load is a, a well-cited, well-researched um, load variable that Catapult has. Uh, essentially, player load per minute can tell us the intensity of the work that those athletes are doing in games and practices per minute. The EE there, that explosive efforts, is a frequency count of the number of explosive movements that the athletes do on the ice. Okay? So clearly, you can tell, and we know from other sports, that there's a difference in intensity in practices and games. Okay? That, that's clearly seen in this graph. Now, what's interesting is the distribution of intensity per minute across the whole defensive, um, you know, seven players. But more importantly, when we compare it to, to forwards, the key thing I want you to look at here is the difference between practices and practices from our defensemen and forwards. That might not look like much, but that's a significant difference in the intensity output of the same practices. Sure, there's a difference between practices and games for forwards as well. We know that. But what we decided and what we looked at was if there's a difference in intensity outputs of practice for our defensemen, maybe that's something we need to start looking deeper at. So then we started to look at some simple game models. And we looked at what happens in games that we, that we win and games that we lose. Now, looking at those at uh, the top one there, that explosive efforts, Clearly, there's a downward trend. They're not able to maintain their explosive output across all three periods. So while fitness might be an issue, that's pretty standard across a lot of sports. Um, it's just the slope of the line that we want we to um, try to figure out. But also, if you look at what happens in games you win versus games you lose, we're trying to probably push the pace a lot, maybe playing from behind. There's a, it's a multifactorial element of games that win versus games you lose. But the key here is there's something is happening that our defense obviously aren't maintaining that play, right? So our data is backing up what our coaches are saying. Now we need to figure out why. Well, if we go back to that previous slide, what we started to look at was our defense just weren't getting exposed to the same amount of uh, explosive intensity that our forwards were. Now, we, we, we looked at forwards. They're a little bit flatter. Now, they're a little bit flatter because there's more of them. So they can maintain their explosive effort. They usually get a little bit more rest than uh, uh, our, our defensemen do. But really what we wanted to see is we wanted to try them to answer this question. So we took this information back to the coaching staff. We said, listen, there is something here. So we, we talked to them about uh, what happens when you plan a practice. Well, like most coaches, they think technical, tactical first. We need to work on our neutral zone four check. Okay, let's drop some drills with our neutral zone four check. Oh, we also got scored on on our, power, on our PK twice last game, so we need to do some penalty kill. 
I tried to get our coaches to think about the physical element of our drills, okay? So what exposure does that neutral zone forecheck have for our D? Well, they get a puck and then they regroup and they come back and that's not the intensity you want them to, to play with in a game when you want them to snap into uh, jumping the rush, et cetera, et cetera. So what we tried to do is we tried to get them to focus on our defensemen in our drills or when they split into offensive and defensive positional specific work, instead of just standing at the blue line and having them take 50 slap shots or one-timers, we got them skating. And what's really interesting is just in three months, I looked at our, our gameplay after, our in-game explosive efforts went up 44%. Now, obviously, there's a lot of arousal as the games at the end were in the Olympics. So there's obviously an arousal and a big stage play there than just kind of regular season exhibition gameplay. But, you know, certainly as an applied sports scientist, I was very proud of our coaches that they embraced this information. And again, we all, we all want to win. We all want to try to win. So I was very proud of our coaches to take that information, feed it back into the practice and into the players, and have a marked difference in their improvement. And our coaches will say, yes, our, our defense did play better towards the end of the year. So the second question I want to talk about now is now that we start to understand what games and practices are like, how does that feed into a different element of our player preparation? And I'm going to talk about some of the work I do with our men's world junior team or our under 20 men's program. And again, my job with them is to help better prepare our, our physical you know, perspective. I try to get those coaches to understand the drills that we do on the ice feed into the physical performance of our players. The physical pillar is, is you know, there to support the technical, tactical elements. And this is, a, this is a term I stole from a presentation, a colleague of mine, Ben Rosenblatt, who works with um, English soccer, and they do a lot of tournament preparation. But essentially, we need to prepare our athletes to best sustain whatever the coaches need to do when they need them. It doesn't matter if it's the gold medal game, the quarterfinal game. We need to put our players in the best position to succeed from both a mental skills side of things, so that's one of our pillars of performance, physical side of thing as well. So what I do is I take our calendar, our pre-competition calendar, and I put in our, what I think our estimated practice volumes and intensities should be. So our coaches plan when we want to practice and we have our games, but I'll make recommendations. So this is from last year's tournament. So if you look on December 18th there, that says that's a short medium day. Well, that short is about 30 minutes or less of a medium intensity. We can measure that through our wearable technology, through using our catapult data, knowing what our coach's averages intensities are, versus a day on the 25th there where we want a short duration, high intensity. We want a high intensity right before a game. We're coming off an off day. We want to give them our players some exposure to intensity so they have an understanding of playing at game pace before we put them into a back-to-back -back scenario. Now, the one question I always get is, you know, that's all well and good, but do coaches follow through on it? And the good part is, if you measure it, you can then feed that information back to them. So one of the things that I do is I plot it and say, okay, how did we do in relation to what we wanted? And I, I find this is a very key visual to give back to our coaches of, so they can start to understand which days were hard and which days were easy. Now, I, I, I'm going <clears> to <throat> walk you through this just a little bit. So this was last year's tournament. Uh, we had a unique schedule in that the games on the 26th, 27th, 29th, and 30th. So double back-to-backs, that's our round robin. What's cut off here is, is January 2nd is when the, the medal round started. So this is just our round robin. But the game on the 26th, that was against um, Finland, one of our, our tougher opponents. First game of the tournament, obviously high arousal state, everybody's excited. These games were in Buffalo, New York, so not far from uh, the border, so we had a, a very good crowd. Uh, you can see some fatigue present on that second day, game day. Uh, loads were down a little bit more. Our coaches did a, a better job of distributing the load. Okay, so they played. We, had, we played a little bit of a weaker opponent. 
uh, so they could distribute the load a little bit, so our average player load was down. The game on the 29th was outdoors. That was a game against the Americans outdoors. We lost in a shootout. Uh, it's our highest loaded day. We played an extra period plus a shootout, okay? But what's interesting is look at that, the, the, as much planning and as much preparation as you do, uh, that our lowest load was that fourth game. So one of the things I always say is we can prepare as much as we want, but the player's output is what matters the most. We still won. Again, it was fortunately for us against a weaker opponent. Our coaches could distribute the load a little bit more across the game. Now, the one thing I do want to tell you with all of this information that we do, we do measure, it is only one key piece of our preparation and our performance. One of the things that, that I do with my job is I take all of our data streams that come in from our subjective wellness questionnaires, from our internal load monitoring, we use a, a simple uh, HRV app. Our, our women's team uh, wears heart rate system on the ice uh, that can code with our catapult system. And I put, I put it all together to then feed this information to the coaches. This is my dashboard. Nobody else sees this dashboard on, a, on the coaching staff because it's too confusing for them. I take this information and I pare it down and I give considerations and summaries. And I always say to the coaches, I'm gonna give you Here's my considerations and our, my recommended changes that we should possibly make. And I say it that way and I frame it that way because I'm not the one that needs to face the, the media at the end of the day. They need to decide if they want to push their players hard in practice or not. But because we have a good dialogue and good structure of reporting in place and good trust with each other, a lot of times they'll be like, yes, we'll go with that way, or no, we're going to go this way, and that's fine. And as a support person, my job is to accept that and then make any changes or suggestions to previous days if, if our loads ran hot today or not. Now, the one last example I want to leave you with here, this is this year's tournament. And one of the things we believe in is front loading to allow our athletes to peak. And, and I will be lying to say if, uh, that not all tournaments come out as nicely as you want. From a data visualization and data management perspective, this worked out perfectly. Our athletes were starting to peak and trend upwards as we head, headed into the medal round. I don't know how many Canadians are here right now, but you will know that this year, tournament didn't work out like we wanted to. We ended up losing. As much as I talk about player performance, player readiness, we still play a sport. Okay, you can't control for a puck bouncing off a player's shin pad, hitting the post, rolling up the goalie and going in to tie the game with 30 seconds left. Nor can you control for an athlete missing a penalty shot in overtime, which would have won the game, or a stick breaking with an open net, they going down to score. It doesn't matter. It's, there's still a human element that, that can't get accounted for for all of, the, all of what we do. So two main takeaways I want to leave you with. The first one is we can now start to understand what is happening on the ice. The use of technologies, it gets smaller and gets more reliable and valid, can now get us to understand what 25 athletes are doing down to an individual level. More importantly, we can feed that information back to our coaches to help prepare our athletes better. At the end of the day, we are a performance-based industry. We need to win, we need to perform. So everybody needs to do everything in their power they can to set those athletes up for success. And as I say there, that was a big win. That was a big win for our coaches. That was a big win for our athletes. Everybody understood it. We had been tracking information for three years. We had three years worth of data on our athletes to be able to show them. But that was our biggest win to feed for another three years of, of technology and tracking for our athletes. And then the second thing is data collection versus data action. This is a big thing that I talk to a lot of uh, sports scientists and coaches about. If you're going to collect something, please use it. We collect daily for our athletes to feed that information back to our coaches to better prepare our athletes. Because we measure it, we can manage it. There's a big disconnect between what a coach thinks the intensity of a session is and what an athlete's actual interpretation of that session is as well. But if you have an objective measure of the work that is being performed on the ice through technology, now everybody is on the same page. 
Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed my presentation, and uh, we'll open the floor to questions now. Yeah, question. Um, <clears throat> no, it's, uh, it becomes a comfort thing. Uh, just like anything, uh, the way uh, an athlete feels is really important. My strategy is I'll have a conversation about why it's important for them to wear, and I will then tell them to wear it or ask them to wear it, and I'll say, hey, listen, I'm going to come check with you about 15 minutes into practice, see if it's still bothering you. So when they come over for a water drink, I'll be like, hey, so how, how are you feeling today? Is, is everything okay? They'll be like, yeah, like, what are you doing out here? Why are you talking to me? They'll forget about it. It's just like when they get new shin pads, they feel weird, and then when they go out into their sport, they forget that it's there. Unless, of course, they take some, a hit or something to it, but that's very infrequent. Um, I have tried to present some of that information to our coaches uh, more from a theoretical base because one of the things I, in my role uh, as the sport performance guy, I take care of everything off the ice and leave a lot of what happens on the ice. We don't have a true dedicated analytics team. Um, I've tried to present some of those concepts to coaches, but uh, as they say to me, when it comes down to it, I'm putting my best players on the ice. You know, one of the things we've tried to theoretically talk about is each player has a finite load to where we can maximize their measured explosive output. And then too much load starts to drop that ratio down. So what is that maximal load? Well, if I, and I'm just going to make this up, if I know for me that's 300 units, I don't want to burn through 200 units in the first period, right? I might not play my best player as often. But again, coaches... Uh, from a technical tactical element, they're the masters of their domain. And, and really, uh, in my role, we've tried to kind of have a real clear um, delineation between what we do off the ice and feed information to them versus dictating what they do. Uh, no, you like um, <clears throat> a traditionally, uh, you know there's whatever your, your strategy of loading can be. Catapult can be used in other sports because you can measure what happens in practices and games. And then the manipulation of volume and intensity is up to the practitioner. So what I do would be different than maybe what these guys do uh, within their own sport. But, uh, you know, there's concepts of tactical periodization out there that look at uh, hard days, easy days. Each day has a different goal to it. Um, and as long as you're measuring those kind of high-low moments um, from from an actual objective point, then it can be applied in any sport. Yeah. Uh, so the question, the reasoning of lack of uh, research on hockey players, um, it's a great question. I have no idea. A lot of it um, might be uh, just uh, the applied research in North America is still an emerging field, I would say, of actual true applied research. Uh, compared to some of the other um, countries out there uh, that have a lot more easier access to, to athletes and, and teams and high-level teams. Um, certainly, I think uh, the barrier-based nature of the sport behind boards and glass, along with the closed environment that a lot of teams kind of in North America have here a little bit, um, I fortunately, with our relationships, you know, I, I've been working with Hockey Canada since 2010, so... We have those relationships and that ability to break down those barriers, but it's certainly something I would like to see grow. Uh, certainly female ice hockey, all of my uh, academic work is using our uh, world-class subset data from our elite female athletes, so I'm trying to push that information out there as well. Yeah, question. Uh, yeah, so the question was the HRV that we measure. Um, so we, we start measuring our guys in August. 
and we measure them all the way through until the end of the tournament, which is in January. So we get a, a, just a baseline morning measurement. Um, again, we, we're trying to figure something that's non-invasive, easy for them to do. They're under 20, so they have a lot going on, and sometimes I think they forget to tie their shoes if they didn't have laces in them. So um, we try to keep it as simple and easy as possible for them. Okay, that's all we have today. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you coming to hear me talk today. Thank you.